so you guys can just uh, go ahead. Hey, Dylan. I'm going to step out. Hey, Dylan, Peter. Hello. Hi, Avi. How are you? Good, good. Um, uh, okay, so I think first we should clarify our positions on the protective um, it is my position that the protective measures are justified, um, and if anything, they are not enough. Um, so your position, I'm assuming, would be that they are unjustified. Is that correct? Uh, well, not quite. Uh, my position basically is that the quarantine has... Basically, the way it works is it's only good as long as we can keep it. And if we lift it, that defeats the purpose of the quarantine. Uh, because there was one of the papers that I read, it's like the whole premise of the quarantine is to flatten the curve to prevent overload of the healthcare system. But one of the mm -hmm. papers, yeah, it states that as long as we don't have herd immunity, as long as we don't have like mass vaccinations or whatever, then as soon as you lift the quarantine, you're still going to get the surge anyway. And yeah. the way I see it, yeah, is that true? Like, <clears throat> yeah, not as bad as like the initial surge, but sure, like it, you're gonna, you're probably gonna surge out. the The purpose of the quarantine is to buy time. It's effectively to buy time until yeah. either a treatment or a vaccine comes to fruition. Um, when a treatment or a vaccine comes to fruition, um, well, there's a couple of things you're buying time for. Number one, if you're trickling in the surging the hospital system at once. You are not overloading healthcare capacity, and people are going to have some form of natural immunity. How durable that immunity is remains to be seen, but there is some sort of natural immunity in the population, which will do something. Um, the second thing you're buying time for is a treatment. Um, the third thing you're buying time for is the development of, of a vaccine, which is already underway. And then once, once all, once those things are in place then you will be able to lift the protective measures without a resurgence. That's the idea. Yeah, I get that. But the issue is, like, developing vaccines or treatments, it's a long process. It's going to take us at least uh, several months, if not a year or more. And, like, the social and the economic costs of, like, maintaining a lockdown for that long, that's pretty much... Yeah. Do you know the social... I'm sorry, you cut out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my point is, like, the costs of such a long-term quarantine are basically going to devastate society, so that no politician is ever going to go for it. They're well, going to lift the... that quarantine a lot sooner than that, regardless of whatever happened. To lift the quarantine sooner than that, regardless of whatever happens? Yeah, like, say we don't have a treatment or a vaccine for, like, a year, for example. Do you think anyone will keep this global lockdown for a year or more? Like um, yes, I, I do think I do think that's what's going to happen. I think that's what's already happening. Um, and as long as is what's required is, I think, what's going to end up happening. There are some countries, I suspect, that are going to uh, restrict the protective measures, and they're going to see a resurgence, and they're going to start in the same problem they were before, and they're just going to have to re-implement the protective measures again. Only like wildfire. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I'm predicting. Um, the other thing to consider is that if we do let, if we do re remove the protective measures, you would also have to factor in the economic consequences and social consequences of those things happening, both in terms of morbidity and mortality. So, it's not just the deaths. It's not just the people who are going to be killed. It's the issue of more the suffering involved in getting the infection, the hospital, the resource costs involved in treating such infections and managing such infections, even among people who are probably not going to die. And then there's the economic costs of the long-term consequences, which we're not even sure of, but there's some indication that there may be some pulmonary complications that are long-term. There's even some recent data that's coming out suggesting endocrine um, issues, specifically in men with... Uh, testosterone and luteinizing hormone ratios. There may be, uh, I don't know, again, this is in development, there's no real long-term data, but men who have, there's new data out that men who have recovered from uh, COVID-19 seem to have um, worse testosterone and luteinizing hormone ratios with respect to fertility. So there may, there's no semen analysis yet, but there may actually be um, 
infertility as a consequence of this virus. Uh, and that there's the mechanistic that goes with that is the me- mechanistic speculation is that the ACE2 is expressed in the testes. And that's the protein that the spike protein on the COVID-19 on the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to infect that and alongside with pulmonary fibrosis as a potential you're looking at. So you're looking at a lot of morbidity, you're looking at mortality. All of these things take money. All of these things are going to be have to be managed by society. All of these things are going, to suffer, are going to cause suffering. So that needs to factor into your economic calculus as well. Uh, well, I agree with what you say. Like, I don't dispute that, but my position, I guess, is more pragmatic. Like, I can envision a lot of like social upheaval and lots of chaos if we maintain this quarantine the way it is for a long period of time. No one's working, no one's making any money, no one's going outside. No yeah, so there's two things there's two things about that. So the first thing is that first of all, we in countries that have maintained quarantines or have maintained at least, if not quarantines, very strict policies. Um, we haven't seen this sort of upheaval. We haven't seen this sort of uh, rebellion or whatnot. It seems to be going just fine, and they seem to be controlling the virus. Um, yeah, but without yeah, God. Well, so far, like the only country that had such a strict quarantine is China, which is like an authoritarian dictatorship. Like they just shoot you in the street if you like. Okay, so something. by 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 protective measures, I don't just mean that type of protective measure. There are other strong protective measures that have worked in other countries. So for example, South Korea, they've had strict protective measures and it was intrusive with the government. What they had, uh, they had the combination of a couple things. They had mass testing and they also had an app that basically tracked everyone and let ever let people know when they were in a hundred meters of these regions. And then there are other countries like Japan where they have very strong social norms. They were all wearing masks. And then there's, um, there's another country as well. Here. In fact, I can post the. Yeah, there's another country. Hong Kong is another one that seems to be. Um, Hong Kong involves school closures. They did involve a quarantine. Again, there are different cultures than we are. But the point is that we don't see this type of a people. We don't see this type of resistance that we're talking about. People are. Well, pretty much one and the same. Now, I understand the United States and maybe Canada have different mentalities. That's a mentality and culture problem. The mentality needs to change for them. Um, that's not a, an issue of, uh, well, it's just impossible. You know, There are ways around it. There are ways of keeping people afloat um, to fight this virus. It doesn't just have to be that everyone just goes bankrupt. It's going to take a, an economic downturn. I mean, there's going to be economic consequences of the shore. But again, there's also going to be economic consequences of, and death and suffering of just letting this thing spread like wildfire. And the key is it just sounds incredibly stupid um, and asinine to do the latter and just let, let this spread like wildfire and say, okay, well, just we got to keep the economy around people and cause a bunch of suffering and flood the hospitals. But do you think like it would be feasible because like they said China, for example, they said they have no new cases as a result of the quarantine. But then a couple of days ago, an article came out said they found 60 new cases because of people traveling in. No, I, I don't think they they don't have any new cases. Um, I think that they have controlled the amount of cases that they have such that it's not exponentially growing. Yeah. And the same thing with the deaths related to it. I think, And I think that's also the case for South Korea and Hong Kong and Japan. And they're all involving similar things. They're either involving a governmental imposed quarantine. They're involving uh, a cultural uh, obedience to the, to the experts that are recommending these prevent protective measures. Involve, uh, a lot of times they involve masks. And they also involve either some sort of intrusive some sort of intrusive government uh, intervention like South Korea, where they tracked, they, they had very good tracing, testing and tracing. And other quarantines such as school, school closures, etc. 
That's we see it see in Hong Kong. Um, so those are the success stories. They all involve similar things. They all seem to have done what we should be, what I'm suggesting we do, the protective measures. And we don't see this collapse that is so bad that everyone's revolting and we see this everything going just terrible. Um, like the narrative that the people on the economic side are trying to say. I mean, yes, there's economic consequences of it, but we don't see this complete disaster. On the other hand, for the countries that are not complying with the that are not obedient with the protective measures, we do see these complete devastating consequences. We do see mass death. We do see the hospitals overrun. We do see untold suffering. And so it seems pretty clear just looking at the outcomes that we ought be maintaining protective measures. Yeah, well, I think the quarantine hasn't been on for too long. Like, what's the longest it has been? Maybe a month? Two? Oh, well, let's see. Um, well, even... Well, hold on. Let me, well, we can see just how long it's been on. Um, like, like, basically, my yeah, point even, is... Maybe, yeah. yeah, even, yeah, like, even yeah. so... Even even yeah. so, it's it's yeah. the idea. Um, we've had some people in the chat saying it's three months in China, um, but even so, it's still based on speculation. You're you're spe you, I can speculate just as well as you can. So you can speculate that there's going to be worse economic consequences and the lease is some devastating thing if the quarantine lasts um, longer. Uh, I can speculate that if it doesn't, we would just be at start one again. We would just go back into exponential growth, which is not really a speculation. It's what seems to happen. Um, and we just go back to devastation again, including economic devastation. So I can speculate just as well as you can. So that doesn't seem to be a point to your side any more than it would be a point to my side. A type of speculation. Uh, actually, I would have to disagree with this because, like, let's say, for example, worst case scenario, everyone gets infected with COVID-19. Uh, mortality rate is, what, 2 or 3%? 3% of the population dies. It wouldn't be 2 to 3%. I know if everyone gets at the same time, it would be much, much higher. Um, the reason it would be much, much higher is because if everyone gets it at the same time, um, what will happen is we will surge the hospital, uh, the healthcare system, and the healthcare system wouldn't be able to handle that load at the same time. There would liter literally be people dying outside of the hospital if everyone got it at the same time. You wouldn't see a two to three mortality rate. Um, you would see you would see ten plus mortality rate if you're lucky. Just look look at Italy and just what's starting to happen to their mortality rate. You don't, you don't see 2 to 3%. It would be much higher. That's the whole idea. The whole problem with this, the whole problem with letting this thing go into exponential growth is simply just you're going to surge the hospital system, and that changes the mortality rate. The mortality rate is not fixed in stone. It depends on what we do. It depends on our attitude. It depends on our healthcare capacity, our surge capacity. It depends on how much we're surging it. Everyone getting COVID-19 at the same time is an incredibly bad idea. Yeah, I see your point about this one. Uh, I still don't see any reason to assume it can go as high as 10%. Or... Look at Italy. Yeah, but Italy is a false example because Italy's population is unusually old. Like, Italy has one of the oldest populations, and we all know that the mortality rate is higher with older people and people with comorbidities. So look at any crazy. look at any analysis during the surge. Look at any analysis during the surge period controlling for the for, for 14 days. It's not it's it's not you're not going to get numbers like any any country that has anything. You could use Italy. You could use. Let's say we could even just look at closed cases in Spain. Close cases in Spain, um, the mortality, like the active cases is 8% right now. The deaths of the closed cases is 32%. If you look at the United States, um, where the United States uh, mortality rate is going for closed cases. 
Um, uh, let's see. Let's... I don't actually see a closed case uh, graph for the U.S. for some reason. We can look even at the United Kingdom. Um, the close for closed cases, um, the so you see a massive difference between active cases and closed cases. And in the UK, the active um, <clears throat> the uh, active cases would get you about one percent. The closed cases, uh, the mortality rate is around eighty-eight percent. But that's just closed more in between that. Look at any time there's surging is happening. You're not going to get like just just think about this conceptually, and we can get into the numbers. Um, and we can look at Italy even, even uh, there may be data on Italy for which we can stratify it based on, actually there's a paper on this I believe, we could stratify it based on not, even looking at the not so old. So there's a paper for a case fatality rate in COVID-19 patients in Italy. And even if we look at those who are just, um, you know, the case fatality rate is 7.2%, and yes, they have a more elderly population. But uh, it's not just that they have an elderly population, because there are, there are other populations that, are, that have similar um, population distributions, yeah. and they also don't have this type of case fatality rate because they're not surging their hospitals. Yes, it's true. They have a they have an elderly population. That being said, we don't expect a case fatality rate close to 10%, even with that. The problem with the issue with Italy is that the bigger issue here is that the healthcare system is being surged. Yeah. And I'll tell you with some of the things that are happening in Italy. Um, one of the things that's happening because of this is, be, is that they don't have the capacity to take care of everyone and have to ration care. So that involves taking people off ventilators that are being saved by the ventilator because they need to use the ventilator for younger people. And simply putting the elderly patients on morphine instead so they could die peacefully. Yeah. yeah. They just don't have enough capacity. So it's not just that Italy is elderly, and that's why you're seeing high CFRs. Uh, if, if Italy had a hospital capacity that wasn't overwhelmed, yes, you would have a higher CFR, but you wouldn't get anywhere close to 10%. Yeah. So the age, the age is not the only factor. Point being, yeah. we're not going to have a good time if we surge our healthcare capacity. We don't want to do that. This is going to like that's just going to shoot the CFR, the case fatality rate up really high. So, to my fundamental point, I'm just going to drop a an argument, a formal argument here. Um because we are talking about this debate proposition. So, here's my argument. I'm posting it in general. So, premise 1 if the protective measures increase utility and is not harms, then the protective measures should be implemented. P and not Q implies R. Premise two, the protective measures increase utility and said utility is not outscaled by deontic harms. P and not Q. Conclusion, the protective measures should be implemented. So let's start with the form of the argument. Do you agree or disagree? Do you agree or disagree with the form of the argument? Hello, I can't hear you. Oh, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, just a second. Can you hear me now? Can others hear me? Uh, I can oh, hear I both can. of you fine. Can Here, let's see who can hear and who can't. Avi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, Peter, can you hear me? Barely, like the sound is so low. Okay, so did you maybe turn speakerphone off? No. Speak of phone. Are you on a cell phone? Yes. Uh, make sure it's on speaker, maybe, if, if you want more noise, or turn up your cell phone volume, or just leave and rejoin the conversation. You could close Discord okay, and good. reopen it. Yeah, now it's better. Now it's good. Okay. Okay, so I'll post the syllogism again in general. 
So the premise one is, if the protective measures increase utility and said utility is not outscaled by deontic harms, then the protective measures should be implemented. Premise two, the protective measures increase utility and said utility is not outscaled by deontic harms. Conclusion, the protective measures should be implemented. Okay, well, I guess I will challenge premise two. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, not, not for right now, but say hypothetically, say because you have no guarantee that we'll ever find a vaccine or a cure, right? We never know. So let's say the efforts fail or take too long and it turns out months and years. So sooner or later, obviously, you have to lift up the quarantines. Like we're not going to keep it forever. You see my point? Yeah, so a couple of things, a couple of things with that. Um, the first issue with that is that even if that is the case, even if we don't end up having a cure or a vaccine, you would still end up with less, far less lives being lost because it would be a trickling into the healthcare system as opposed to the a surging of the healthcare system. And number two is if you, if you have a trickling into the healthcare system, even if that's the case, you will have a group of people with natural immunity, even if they're not getting immunity through a vaccine. So yeah. again, if everyone will get infected, you'll have some amount of natural immunity. Um, even if you don't have a vaccine. So you may be able to lift up some of that, um, those protective measures. The point being, though, is that you won't, you'll have it developed in such a way that the hospital capacity is not surged. And the other thing is, we have no reason you won't eventually have a vaccine be developed. Yes, it's always possible. Um, but we are moving very, like there's an enormous amount of effort. If there was any amount of effort that's being put into a vaccine, it's this vaccine right now by many, many different countries. Um, and so that doesn't guarantee that there will be an effective vaccine, but it certainly increases the probability just because so many different countries are putting all of their resources into it. Um, so you challenged P2. I'll just give an argument for P2. So premise one is if the protective measures save millions of lives and unt untold suffering and the deontic harms amount to travel restrictions and congregation restrictions, then the protective measures increase utility and said utility is not outscaled by deontic harms. P and Q. Premise two, the protective measures save millions of lives and untold suffering and the deontic harms amount to travel restrictions and congregation restrictions. P and Q. Conclusion, the protective measure utility is not outscaled by deontic harms. So the conclusion there is for premise two. Um, so if you, do you accept the form of the argument for uh, premise two? Well, I guess my question is not about the deontic harms. My question would be that the protective measures can themselves cause harm in terms of reducing well-being. So for example, like the economic collapse, people lose their jobs, people lose their homes, people lose their income. Well, yes, but again, we had this. We discussed this already. Yeah. So the yeah. the issue is that's that's going to happen. That's going to happen um, even if we lift the restrictions. If we let this spread, like, what, what do you think is going to happen to the economy and people's jobs if people are dying in the streets? If we surge our healthcare system, and if we have an enormous amount of money that's just going to be spent on um, spent on the short-term from this disease, and if we just simply let it spread like wildfire, um, what's gonna, the, con the economic consequences of that will be devastating as well. Just the premiums on people's insurance are going to skyrocket because there's going to be an enormous amount of people who are not going to be able to pay for these uh, procedures, pay for the health care, and it's not, illegal, it's not legal for us to turn them away. So what's going to happen is the insurance companies are, e are either going to demand money from the government, or they're going to just increase the premiums on everyone else, you're going to end up having to pay an enormous amount of money. Also, um, there's going to be an enormous amount of people who are going to be out of work because of this. Um, there's going to be, if people are congregating at work, there's going to be an enormous amount of people who are going to be suffering at work, who are going to be getting sick at work. It's not going to be this dichotomy between having a great, wonderful boost bolstering economy, you could very well have an economic collapse if you lift these restrictions. And so I don't see that as, maybe it will be uh, somewhat of a better economy, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be, 
So I don't think it's gonna it's that dichotomy is real. I think there's gonna be an I think you're not considering the economic potential of harm for this virus in and of itself. So again, I'm just gonna repost this argument for P2. And I'm just gonna say what first of all, I'm just gonna ask you if you agree with the form of the argument. Yeah, I agree with the form of the argument. I guess Okay, yes, do you agree we're... with premise one? I agree with premise one, yeah. You agree with premise two? Premise two, I am doubtful about. I guess yes. premise what two. What are you doubtful about? Why? Because premise two, it depends on a lot of calculations. Like it depends on what kind of protective measures and how long. Well, we already specified which protective measures. Yeah. We specified travel restrictions and we specified restrictions yeah. on congregations, congregating. I'm talking about like full yeah. quarantine, like the one we have now where like everything we is don't, closed. We, we don't have a full, that's not a full quarantine. What we have now is not China. Oh, uh, we have, it's almost the same. No, almost not really. Not at all. Not, not at all. We don't have, we, first of all, we don't have domestic travel restrictions. We have an, an encouragement for non-travel. We don't, it's completely legal actually to go from one area to another. You can actually move between states still. We do, we do not have a, um, we don't actually have any law. Um, maybe California, I have to check the state law in California, but federally we actually don't have a law. Um, we also don't have, um, we also... Yeah, go ahead. Just to clarify, Sorry. I'm actually from Canada, so I don't know the situation in the U.S. Here oh, do Canada, you do you have a federal? Is there a federal law in Canada preventing travel? Not yet, but it was talked about in the news. Okay, like, so you don't, you don't, you actually things. don't, you actually don't have a quarantine then, by definition. If you you're free to move all over the country, that's not a quarantine. You understand that, right? Uh, probably not for long. I think. Yeah, there were serious Okay, but, uh, like, yeah, but okay, yes. but okay, Avi. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's inaccurate. We have a travel ban globally, and a domestic travel ban starts on Monday. Okay, so in Canada, there's a domestic travel ban that starts on Monday. That's right. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Okay. Cool. So you will have, but you will eventually have it some form. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. You should. Good. Excellent. Um. So what's, so what's the issue with P2? So the protective measures, um, I mean, look, based on all the data, it's clear that they globally, certainly that the millions of lives will be saved. All the projections estimate that there will be, um, if we did not have protective measures, we would have millions of people who would be dying otherwise. There would be untold suffering. That seems very clear. Um, and the deontic harms uh, to travel restrictions and congregating don't seem to any, in any way outscale the consequences so yeah i mean i i just don't see why anyone wouldn't accept p2 uh and it, look again saying economic harms though number one it's a, just like we can mitigate um the health consequences we can also mitigate the economic harm consequences there may be policies mitigate those economic harms to get us through that period of time so we don't know that there's going to be this collapse Number, uh, secondly, when we look at other countries that have gone through quarantines, they haven't had this economic collapse, nor do they have this upheaval. Um, number, I mean, and the other point is just that you have to consider the economic harms of letting this virus just go around killing everyone. Uh, yeah, so what's the argument against P2? Well, it wouldn't go on kill everyone. It, it's not. not a, no, not 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 yeah. Ever, not. Yeah, not. Uh, yeah. It's an exact. Yeah, it's a it's a figure of speech. Yeah, going around and going around and surging the healthcare system, getting our case fatality rate up to ten percent, having enormous morbidity, not just mortality, scarring up the lungs of people who actually contract the disease. Increasing the health that will have long term consequences, even on an economic. So I, I just don't see why anyone would think. I, I have no idea why anyone would think that the econ that the economy not only that it's worth it, but that 
the difference, the differential between the economy would actually be worth it. You don't actually know that the economy is going to be a, a good thing if you let this virus spread like wildfire. There are good reasons to believe the economy is actually going to be not so good. In fact, maybe pretty bad. There are ways around it. There are ways of getting people to work from home. It's not, again, there's no perfect solution here, but there are ways of keeping the economy running while at home, while not congregating. You can have a, a, an, an economy working in some, in some, in some degree. Again, it's not going to be a perfect solution, but there are ways of mitigating the harms while, while staying away from each other. Hello? Yes, hello. Oh, yeah, you sure? Yeah. I'm sorry, come again? What? Well, I guess it's a matter of speculation because something like this has never been done before. So, well, no, it's not. It's not just speculation because this has been again. Like on my side, I have outcomes. I have four countries that have done some form of quarantine or government um, intrusiveness to impose certain uh, behaviors on their populace, and they all seem to have been working. They all seem to control the virus, and their economy doesn't seem to be collapsing such that they're having untold suffering. So I have at least four examples of outcomes in my favor, and you have no examples in your favor. Wait, hold on. Which ones are the four? You said Italy and China? No, no, no. No, no, no. The, the countries that have had success. Um, okay. We're talking about China. We're talking okay. about okay. South Korea. We're talking about Hong Kong. And we're talking... Hold on. What was the one before Japan? Ha Hong Kong. Hong Kong, okay. Yeah, what well, yeah. China. Yeah. Well, no, no. Hong Kong is very, very different from China. It's the, they operate very differently. They um, they're controlled very differently. They're they're in mainland. They're part of China, but they're not they, they're not governed governed in the same way that the Chinese are governed. In fact, they're capitalist. They're a capitalist system. They're not. They're not a communist system. Well, technically, China is not exactly a communist either. Okay, well, we yeah, rega semantics. regardless, yeah. Re yeah, yeah, regardless of getting into those semantics, it's very yeah. clear that they're governed very differently, and they should be treated differently. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I have four examples where things have not only worked to control the spread of the virus, but have also protected the measures I'm advocating, and they also have not experienced this devastating economic consequences that you're speculating. On your side of the token, you have no examples of success on your side. So if it's going to be speculation, I would say that my speculation is far more powerful than yours, because my, at least my speculations thus far are backed up by outcomes. Yours aren't. Okay, but did those countries distract, uh, loosen up the restrictions on movements eventually uh, uh, i'm not i'm not sure to what degree they have maybe to some degree then they had certainly haven't fully there's mm. certainly going to be and certainly maybe a function of the what's called the hammer and dance uh that, that's been published in uh that's been uh mentioned by uh in uh in medium which some people don't like but uh we can we can get into that you you quarantine very very strongly, and you get the virus down, and then you li you restrict you lift up some of those restrictions, and then the virus starts going to exponential growth again, and then you then you increase the restrictions again, and you basically keep doing this cycle until you eventually get some kind of game changer, such as a vaccine, or enough of the population develop natural herd immunity, or you get some sort of treatment. That is more or less what these countries are doing in some way, shape, or form for their own respective strategies of combating this virus. And again, the, the, the point just remains. Like, this economic um, collapse, this destruction of society because of the economy just hasn't actually happened. People are finding ways of working without destroying society with this virus. People are finding ways of working from home, working remotely. People are finding ways of, the government is finding ways of helping the, the, the types of work where, uh, where one would need to be in closer proximity to each other to keep those companies afloat.
there are ways around this. None of these ways are perfect, but the point is that it's better than just letting the virus go rampant. Well, yeah, well, to me, that also seems a more plausible solution. So you restrict it until the virus level goes down and then you loosen it. So maybe some people can go to work, some can do recreational activities or go to the beach or maybe travel a little bit. And then if the virus goes up, then you restrict it again. That to me seems a lot more plausible than a full lockdown until like we find a magic. Well, no one, no one's, no one's, no one's, no one's talking about a full lockdown until for a year. Yeah. No one, no one, no one's, that's, no one's been advocating for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. So to me, that seems a much better plan. That's my, that was the main point of my argument that a full lockdown is not something that we can ever sustain long term. Like everything is shut down. No one can leave homes, no travel. Okay. So you don't, so you don't disagree with, with my argument then. You don't disagree with P two, you just you just disagree with P two if the if the protective measures involve the full lockdown for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so they they wouldn't involve the full. I don't think they would involve a full lockdown for a year. Um, here's the here's a um, basic idea I posted in general. Um, it's called coronavirus: the hammer and. Death. And basically, the long term, ongoing long term is going to be that type of. Awesome. Where you keep it under control, you have some restrictions. It, then you have to re-implement some restrictions. Point being, and, and look, if that doesn't, the, the idea is the second wave. We, by that time, you also have some immunity, so that would help as well. So, again, I, I just right now, what we should be doing for sure is a lockdown. There's no question about it. Um, we need a lockdown. We need a travel, complete travel restriction. We need even curfews may be required. Tracing should, should be happening. Testing should be happening. All of these protective measures absolutely should be implemented. Do you disagree with that? I have no problem with those measures. If it's done the way you say that, as a cycle, just to keep the virus down and then we loosen it, then restrict and loosen it, that's fine. Like, I think that society can survive it. As long as it's not something long term, like, you're not going to put everything under lockdown for a year or two or whatever. Well, it wouldn't, I don't think it'll be a complete lockdown for a year, but the point yeah. is, things are going to be very different for a year. The, we're, the way we operate is not going to go back to for a long time. There's going to be a, a different way of living life, and we're going to have to get used to it for quite some time. It doesn't yeah, necessarily yeah. mean there's going to be a long, uh, a complete lockdown for a year, but we'll see. Maybe it w maybe we're, we will have to have a complete lockdown for a year. I don't know. It depends on how things pan out. It's just right now, for sure, we do need a complete lockdown, especially when we don't have immune people in the population to any substantial degree. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So yeah, we yeah. agree that the current, the, the protective measures, the public health protective measures are justified then. Yeah, for the time being. Okay, the cool. Time being. We'll see how it goes okay. in the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, yeah, for sure. Uh, we always are going to have to see what the future brings. But yes, yeah. so in the time we agree that the public should absolutely be implemented. Okay, I don't see what we disagree about then. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you as well.